great. Um, all right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, for having me. It, it is really exciting to be here because uh, actually one of the very first uh, kind of formal academically minded talks I ever gave about this was at uh, Sen6 in Cambridge. And yeah, so now this is uh, one of the, the last I'll probably give for Immusoft. And it's, uh, it's exciting. We've uh, accomplished uh, a lot since then. And actually, really, the, uh, the space itself has evolved a lot since then, which is at least as important. I mean, back then, there were no approved cell or gene therapies. You know, gene therapy is generally considered a bad word. And, uh, and now the, the space has really uh, taken off. And uh, so I guess. Maybe just to start, you know, I think one of the reasons it's really exciting to be in this space now is that we're effectively entering a, a whole new era of medicine. I mean, for most of human history, medicine consisted of basically plants and prayers, you know, small molecule drugs that you mashed up from plant matter. And, uh, and it wasn't until a few hundred years ago that we had our first kind of biologics, you know, first as like crude live vaccines and then, you know, initially blood and serum projects. And, uh, and then it, we started growing these uh, biologics recombinantly. Um, and, and then even more recently started actually making treatments of living cells themselves. But it wasn't really until the, the past few years that things really got interesting in my mind. And uh, that's when we started modifying those cells before we put them back in. And that might not seem like a huge distinction, but uh, conceptually uh, it's a bridge was crossed where we began to really treat diseases with information instead of chemistry. And I think that's, that's really exciting and, and not to be really underestimated. In fact, this is really how I got into the world of biology. So uh, my background was in computer science and physics, and, uh, and I began to think about uh, information as it relates to life. And what really kind of captured my imagination uh, initially were vaccines. And I mean, everyone takes for granted that if you get a vaccine, you know, a, a disease that used to kill you won't even give you the sniffles. But uh, if you think about, you know, why is that? I mean, nothing's fundamentally changed about the pathogen or your immune system. It's, it's just information. And, uh, and I know it's not really a common way of looking at this field, or certainly not, you know, a canonical way of approaching it, but, uh, but the essence of life is really information. I mean, if you think about it, if you take away the information in your DNA, you're a few bucks worth of chemicals sitting on the floor. And, uh, but with information, your life. And I mean, right now, my body, even as I speak, is busy turning you know, lunch and a good gallon or two of coffee into mat. And uh, it does this every day. And so if you can manipulate that information, you can do anything. The, the building blocks of life. And, uh, and so I think, well, you know, if, if this is true, why aren't we treating diseases with information more? And I think, you know, the simple answer is really cells don't have USB ports. There's no way of getting them in. And, uh, but I, I would pause for a second and have you consider, you know, what would the world look like if you basically had an app store for the human body? And uh, this is basically where we went with this company. When we first started, we had a kind of a crazy ambition to, to recreate the biochemical environment of youth as you aged. And I mean, if you think about it, uh, lots of things change as you age. Uh, I think obvious ones like estrogen or testosterone. But uh, you can never take enough drugs to put back everything. Uh, although if you could manipulate the information, you could do whatever you wanted. And so what we've really uh, come up here with is, is kind of a whole new treatment paradigm. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to kind of walk you through where, where the company's at and what our first indication is, which isn't especially relevant to aging, but I think it, it's significant uh, for where we're going. And then I'll, I'll come back to aging later. So this is our first uh, indication. It's uh, for a rare lysosomal storage disease, a genetic disease called MPS1. And basically these patients have a genetic defect that prevents them from making an enzyme in the lysosomes of their cells, in this case alpha l hydronidase. And the standard of care is either hematopoietic stem cell transplant uh, before they're two and a half or enzyme replacement. Mm -hmm. And the enzyme replacement is super expensive. It's uh, at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. And uh, transplants are, are dangerous. And uh, the uh, transplant can, can do more good, but uh, they also cost a lot of money and uh, they don't address everything. And so even though this is a really rare disease, uh, the company that makes it, uh, it's Biomarin and Genzyme and uh, now Sanofi, uh, still makes about $200 million a year on it. So it's a, it's a reasonable target for a small company like ours to get started. And so this, uh, I think, will resonate uh, well with the audience in that what we're doing effectively is, is 
you know, creating a new treatment paradigm in general. Like, uh, and a lot of the molecules that might be useful for re reversing the effects of age, or at least ameliorating them, are, uh, are very short half-life, expensive biologics. And uh, like I said, you can never take enough drugs to put back everything that's missing. And uh, in the case of MPS1, which is what that, uh, those graphs are modeled after, uh, patient would go in, they would get their enzyme, it's a three or four hour long infusion in the hospital, and, uh, and basically by the time they go home, it's already gone. It's got a half-life of a couple of hours. And uh, so what we're doing is basically programming their body to produce the treatment on their own. And you can see there from the, the lower graph, you basically get a, a stable level of production that goes on for a very long time. And so this is just a early proof of principle. Um, and so the cells we're modifying are long-lived plasma cells. And these guys have been known for a long time to be responsible for producing the bulk of your serum immunoglobulin. Um, they're just incredibly prolific protein factories. Uh, to put it in perspective, a mature plasma cell can produce somewhere between 10 and 100,000 antibodies per second. So it's like parallel processing on an unimaginable scale. And, uh, and these are actually why if you take blood from an 80-year-old, you can still find antibodies against smallpox. Like, the same cells that were generated all those decades ago when they were exposed to the vaccine or, or the virus are still there cranking out their antibodies. And uh, this is uh, early data from uh, back in the, gosh, the 90s, where uh, these guys showed that if you took, uh, you could vaccinate a mouse, take those long-lived plasma cells out of their spleen, in this case, and inject them into another mouse, and they would confer immunity to that second mouse, and they would continue to produce their antibodies. And uh, so this, uh, this was interesting to me and kind of, uh, further inspiring this idea of producing along with plasma cells to secrete therapeutics. But uh, back to the problem of USB ports, uh, I still didn't have a good way of programming them. So when Immusoft got started, uh, my team and I spent a good year scouring the globe looking for technology that could program these cells. And uh, eventually it led us to the lab of uh, David Baltimore, a Nobel laureate at Caltech, and he had developed a system to transduce hematopoietic stem cells with a lentiviral vector uh, and then culture them all the way into plasma cells, ex vivo, that could secrete broadly neutralizing HIV antibodies. And I suppose one of the beauties of uh, approaching the field from kind of a different space is uh, you see things differently. And uh, I was able to walk into Caltech and get worldwide exclusive rights to this thing, basically unchallenged with no background in the space at all, which I, I thought was great. And uh, we uh, took it and we modified it uh, with a, a lentiviral pseudotype we found at ENS Lyon. Uh, so basically it's the, the shell of measles uh, on the core of HIV on lenti. And uh, one of the problems for my purposes is that the most commonly used uh, lentiviral pseudotype was VSVG, and B cells are basically refractory to it. And, but measles, you know, is super infectious. And uh, it can basically transduce any nucleated cell in the body. And so we made this early proof of concept, and we were able to take blood from a healthy person and make them produce these super rare HIV antibodies. And so this is kind of how, how Immusoft got started. And over the years, we uh, eventually got the system to work with BSVG, and then uh, later abandoned the virus entirely in favor of something called a Sleeping Beauty transposon, which is basically a, a non-viral vector capable of integration. And uh, the real beauty of this for a product like ours is it's you know, relatively dirt cheap and it's super scalable. So. Uh, you know, I, I've tried to keep uh, as much of an, an open source like philosophy to the company as possible away from my earlier computer roots. And, uh, and we can make new, new treatments in a matter of a couple of weeks. So we basically have to people and say, hey, uh, you send us the construct, we'll load it in, we'll send you back the cells, you tell us if it works. If it works, you know, we'll give you a license. If not, well, you know, better luck next time. And we can do that because we don't have to do things like make virus. And if anyone's been following the space, uh, getting uh, clinical scale doses of things like GMP AAV virus or lentivirus is actually quite difficult now. Um, they're, they're expensive and in demand. So before I go too much further, I'll take a step back and uh, just do a quick overview of how this works in practice. Uh, I mean, it's simple enough in principle. We take cells out, we program, we put them back. Um, it's a, obviously a little more complicated in practice, but basically, uh, Patient comes in for a blood draw, we'll culture the cells and put them back and they migrate to these survival niches. And so all this is done with basically off the shelf technology. Um, I'll go through these quick in the interest of time, but you can bug me about them later. So it's like uh, Clinimax, Prodigy, Normal Selection, uh, already used clinically. 
We uh, then electroprate them now because we got rid of the virus and we can load them up quite efficiently. And uh, we, uh, this is for IDUA, it's so MPS1 specific, but uh, basically shows we load in the DNA, the cells make uh, more of the protein as they mature. And uh, the graph there on the right is just showing that the protein is coming out properly modified so it can be taken up by the cells that need it. And this becomes a, a bit of an issue for our platform in that we're making things in B cells that aren't normally made in B cells. And so you need to make sure that they can produce them properly. And fortunately for us, the B cells are incredibly good factories and they've been able to basically make everything we've put in them. But we grow the cells up uh, ex vivo and we can expand these things a lot. Like uh, over the years, we optimize this a bit. I think uh, at the peak, we can make something like 10,000 fold expansion, but we typically don't go anywhere near that. Um, and then we mature them into plasma blasts. And this is some of the IP that came out of the Baltimore lab, and it, it's quite important. So a plasma cell is what we want eventually, but plasma cells are not migratory. And the difference between a long-lived plasma cell that has a lifespan of, uh, I think half-life is 23 years, and a, a normal plasma cell with a lifetime of about a week is actually just their environment. And so the immediate precursor to the plasma cell, the plasma blast, has a chemokine homing receptor on it that will guide it to survival niches. It, uh, it goes to the same niches as CD34 cells. So it migrates with the CXCR4 to CXCL12 or SDF1 if you are into that kind of thing. Um, and if we can, so our process is optimized to make these plasma blasts so that they can engraft properly. Um, We've put these into mice now. So these are human cells now going into immune deficient mice. And uh, we've tracked them out at this point for about uh, six months. And the, uh, there's a few little kind of issues with this in that since the mouse is entirely immune deficient and you're putting a human cell into it, we uh, precondition them with human T cells, just CD4 T cells, uh, and that helps their survival. Um, but it also, you end up with limitations of this in the model. And in uh, this data right here is uh, not relevant for aging, but uh, there's an important takeaway from it I want you guys to see, and that is that uh, we can do repeat dosing on this, uh, unlike things like AAV, and uh, the doses are accretive. And so you could, in theory, take a treatment based on our platform for dozens of different indications, and, uh, or you could do one where you just kept ratcheting up the amount until you got enough of the protein to do whatever you wanted. And uh, in this case, the uh, the horizontal red lines there are the averages of the bars on the last slide, and all it's really showing, so in, in this disease, you need to break down these sugar chains in the lysosomes, that's what's going wrong to begin with, the, the gags, and uh, basically it just shows that even if we get a little bit uh, like it is there on the right, um, we can still reduce the gag substantially, and so we can produce far more than we need to, and this is good for showing we can cure this disease. So uh, we are, Approaching human trials now, we're in the middle of GLP talks. We've made this at human scale, and uh, so we're basically ready to go. We filed the orphan drug designation and all those good things. Um, and happily, uh, the world's generally started to take notice, even outside of the academic space. And this, is, this has been very helpful as we've kind of moved our, our way from an obscure idea in the lab into the real world. And uh, just a fun fact there, the uh, New Scientist story was actually, I was interviewed for that at Sen6, so that was one of the first big pieces written about us in popular press. So uh, now on to the, I guess, the fun stuff for this purpose. Uh, we, uh, you know, recreating the biochemical environment of youth is a tall order for sure, um, but we've started to make kind of first actual progress on this. And we're working with this molecule that the last speaker was talking about, folostatin. And I think most people are probably familiar with this molecule from its interactions with myostatin and myostatin from this character, the, the Belgian blue cow. And so, <laughs> that is not photoshopped. <laughs> the uh, Belgian blue cow is a naturally occurring uh, myostatin mutant. So it has a dysfunctional myostatin gene and uh, that results in about double the muscle mass of a normal cow. So this was first uh, documented in like, 1808 and they're still around today, people breed them still. And, uh, and People have been considering this for quite some time and uh, started messing with mice, uh, like, like the last, in fact, I think that slide was actually chopped up in one of the other slides. Um, I'll make a slightly different point with it though. The, uh, you can see the normal one there on the left. Uh, the one in the middle is roughly equivalent to the Belgian blue cow at about double the muscle mass. The folostatin overexpressor is about four times the muscle mass. And so uh, I hate to be the technician dealing with that mouse. Um, the, uh, this, uh, 
of course, it's not particularly useful therapeutically. These mice are genetically engineered to do this from birth, and uh, so it begs an immediate question for people like me, you know, how do you benefit from this and not be a genetically modified mouse? And uh, I wasn't the first one to think of that, and so some people uh, started injecting uh, even monkeys with AAV that would express the same thing, and obviously electroporation as well, and, uh, and it, it seems to work pretty well, and this has even found its way into human trials for uh, Becker muscular dystrophy and I think Duchenne now as well, and uh, even spontaneous inclusion myelitis. Uh, but uh, there's an interesting little wrinkle here, actually, that I, I thought was kind of amusing about that slide. So fallstone is not normally made in muscles. And I think most of the space assumed it was for a long time, is it myostatin is. It's typically made in the liver. But uh, this, the little bumps on their legs there were because they have these fibrotic lesions, you know, from muscular dystrophy that are effectively trapping the fallstone there. And so they're leading to, like, really high concentrations there and causing bumps, which uh, they say are, are harmless, but still look kind of weird. And so we, uh, our, our approach is a little nicer in that we can make this systemically. So they, the cells that we uh, put back into the patient migrate primarily to the bone marrow and the spleen, and they just secrete this into the blood supply. So uh, this is the, our most recent data. With the caveat, it, it's definitely early data. This study wrapped up only a few days before I left to Europe. Um, and it, it's just our, our first foray into this with mice. We've been making human cells produce it for a long time, but uh, hadn't put them back in the mice. And, uh, and so the treatment, basically, we conditioned the mice with the T cells. One group got a, a bunch of genetically modified B cells, just a few hundred thousand, so not, not very many, really. And uh, then uh, the other ones got PBS. And the, the great news is the, we could detect the statin in the plasma. Um, and you can see it goes up and down there, which is, is pretty normal for our purposes. Like, you'll get a spike when you inject it, and then they stabilize. And uh, like I say, you can do repeat doses later. And, uh, and the antibody levels correlate to statin. This is kind of just specific to our platform. So we put in human B cells into the mice, and uh, they make antibodies still. And we can use the antibodies as kind of a, a surrogate for cell engraftment. And for the most part, they correspond. Uh, I don't know what happened to the other one. Um, but uh, the mice gained weight, which is great. Uh, they got about 4% larger. And this is only over the period of about a month, which might not sound like a lot. But if you think about it in this context of age-related sarcopenia, 4% increase in body mass being muscle is considerable. I mean, this is, a, I think, kind of one of the, the goals for this platform in general, and make the difference between having a walker and, and not having a walker, or being in a wheelchair and being able to walk. And I mean, I often uh, will talk a little uh, equipment at my grandma's expense in that, like, if she takes these drugs, it makes her dizzy, and she falls over and hurts herself. Um, but if I get really drunk and I'm staggering around, I rarely actually hit the ground. And uh, I mean, the basic reason for that is I can just catch myself. I'm stronger. So, uh, physical strength counts for a lot. So they got bigger, and they also got stronger. So on front limb uh, grip, 16% stronger than their controls, and 23% stronger on the foreleg grip and the hang test. And so in considerable improvement in only a month of treatment. So th this uh, study was actually intended to go for two months. It just got started late. Um, but. Uh, we're going to be redoing this with a, a longer study, and we're going to optimize the dose. And uh, there's also, a, we've been working on a purely murine version of this. So uh, one of the issues with these treatments, like I said before, is we have to give them T cells to condition them at the beginning. And one of the beauties of our platform in general is it requires no conditioning in, in humans. Like, it, I mean, this is just how your cells naturally engraft. And so we've been working on making a pure mouse version of it, and then uh, we can run them out indefinitely and hopefully get them for life. So uh, with that, I uh, thank all the people who did all the work and uh, take any questions.